Hi, my name is Dr. John Duyard, and welcome to LifeSpot.com, where we prove the ancient medical wisdom of Ayurveda with modern science. And today's podcast is all about spring cleansing for the body, mind, and spirit. And it's kind of really interesting because that's exactly what spring cleansing is for, is for the body and the mind and the spirit. Uh, it is nature's new year, the spring, a time of year to reset, reset a lot of different things, reset your ability to burn fat as a natural source of fuel. Uh, at the end of the summer, when it's uh, a different harvest, the carbs and the starches and the tubers are being harvested and the grains and the nuts and the seeds are being harvested. It's a higher carbohydrate time of the year where the fuel is for the, for the end of summer into the winter is gonna be more carbs by definition of what's being harvested. In the springtime, those rules are completely different. It's a very austere time of the year. It's a reset for burning fat as your source of fuel. It's a reset for creating more stable emotions, handling stress like water off a duck's back. Fat is your stable, calm fuel, non-emergency fuel, sleep through the night fuel. This is what's happening with nature's near. It's a reset for that. It's a reset to burn fat, and in the fat we store toxins, pollutants, pesticides, preservatives. We store molecules of emotion that make us think and do the same dumb stuff again and again in our lives. And by actually going into the spring and, and helping the body be a better fat burner, we force the body to be a better detoxifier. We force the body to release old uh, molecules of emotion. Ayurveda called it mental ama, that make us think and do the same dumb stuff again and again and again. So every spring you get a chance to lose some extra fat, lose some pounds, reset fat burning, create stability. Um, and release a lot of old mental ama molecules of emotion that, that are linked to patterns of behavior that aren't serving you any longer. You know, Ayurveda <clears throat> was really designed uh, as a technique to bring the body into balance so that would give us a level of, of mental clarity to see more clearly what our mind has conjured up in the name of protective patterns and then actually realize what's real and what's not real and then take action on what's real. So every season, every time spring comes around, every nature's new year, you get a, and that's the new year's resolution, a little late from our Western standards, but clearly a time of year to really get after it and, and, and clean, detoxify, lose weight, get rid of all the winter weight, the excess stored stuff that we didn't use in the winter, get rid of that, lose some weight, burn some fat, stabilize our mood, sleep through the night, reset fat burning, reset our emotional platform so we're clear as opposed to littered with a lot of unwanted emotions. So it's just a powerful, really cool time of the year. And there's so much more uh, when you understand what spring is really about. You know, spring is really about um, a, a, a very interesting time. There's, you know, from the harvesting perspective, it hasn't happened yet. Um, you know, the, the grains and the nuts and the seeds and, and many of the vegetables, they take a longer time. They don't come till midsummer, early summer, or late summer. In the spring, it, there's not a lot to be had in terms of nutrition. So it forces us to burn our stores, burn our reserves, and burn our fat. It's the period of famine, the period of fasting, the period where we, we force the body to burn our own fat and reset things, which is a, a great time of the year. I mean, all the fastings and vision quests and things like that were done in the springtime, right? Um, uh, all the religious fasting would be Lent or Ramadan, uh, Passover, all of these are, are spring type cleanses that have to do with fasting. Uh, in India, uh, in Ayurvedic medicine, uh, fasting was done only in the springtime because it, it was the season to, to do that. Now, one study showed that Americans eat about 100% more food than they need. Uh, and the studies on calorie, calorie restriction, which is what happens in the spring anyway all the time, right, is there's not a lot of food. We force ourselves to eat less. Well, the science shows if you eat 30% less food, that you have all kinds of significant benefits, including weight loss and lower blood pressure and lower risk of heart disease and lower um, you know, the BMI, basal metabolic index, um, 
you have uh, lower blood sugar, lower blood pressure, all kinds of things. I mean, the benefits and the research on calorie restriction is just like off the charts. And that sort of launched all this research into calorie restriction, time restricted eating and fasting. And now we know there's Nobel prize winning science on fasting that shows that when you actually fast, the body goes into a process called autophagy, which, was this, which means eat thyself, where the, where the body starts gobbling up all the unwanted cells that are in between that are, that are not either damaged or not being used, all the intercellular junk that clogs up the lymphatic system gets cleaned up and scrubbed and repaired. So the body takes broken parts and makes new, new parts with them. And uh, so this is what autophagy is about. It's about repairing the broken parts and getting rid of parts that don't work anymore. So, so, uh, Fasting has also been shown to activate stem cell activation, which is the repair of the body. So like powerful, powerful science lives behind this. Studies show that our, our cells live longer, make more energy when we don't feed them to a point. If you starve your body, <clears throat> you will end, <clears throat> end up starving your body, right? So that's not gonna be good in the long run. But we are hardwired, you know, in an evolutionary sense or a genetic sense to actually thrive in situations where we didn't eat because when you don't eat you want your senses to be more acute you want your body to have more energy you want to be able to chase down a lion or whatever it is you're trying to hunt or gather you want clarity and acuity not debilitation when you don't eat so periods of not eating have been shown in numerous studies Nobel Prize winning science in fact to actually give us the incredible benefits that we should do on a regular basis and spring is that time which is why here at Life Spa we do all of our cleanses in the spring and in the fall I'll talk about that in a minute but uh, like our Colorado cleanse which is our two-week uh, digestive reset lymph liver um, cleanse and fat cell detox which is a really powerful reset um, there are short home cleanse which is our four-day detox which is also uh, really powerful which which when you do the short home cleansers are free ebook just download it for free it tells you exactly how to do it step by step by step you end up getting uh, almost identical benefits as the research that shows uh, within a four-day period of time that you can activate stem cell activation by eating a calorie restricted uh, uh, diet during our ghee kitchery based short home cleanse that only happens if you do the, the mono diet which we highly recommend during the short home cleanse and you can download that ebook which is kind of cool so point being is that this is the time to do a major cleanse one to reset fat burning one to lose some extra weight uh, lose the water weight i mean dandelions are classically harvested this time of the year the deer would 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 wait till the spring ground would soften dig up those bitter roots and gobble up those bitter roots dandelion being one of those which is a powerful diuretic which is loaded with potassium so the body with dandelion root tea which most americans drank you know throughout uh history uh throughout europe they drank dandelion root tea it was called piss on lee in 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 france which meant to pee in the bed and every frenchman knew that if you take a lot of dandelion tea before you go to bed you could maybe urinate period on the pee in the bed which would be bad so, um, because it's a powerful diuretic it's loaded with potassium to replenish what you lose when you diuresis. So it's, it's really kind of cool how nature provided, you know, many of these bitter roots to, to help get rid of the extra fluid and what we call kapha in Ayurveda. And spring is what's called kapha season. Think of the word cough or congestion. And kapha is, is governed by earth and water. So think about the earth in the spring. It's heavy, uh, holding on to more water. It's more spring-like we call it allergy season it's a time where the body holds on to more water and it's a time where we hold on to more water so nature is a heavy earthy time of the year now if your body type is kapha and you are in a kapha season which is spring and you're eating kapha aggravating foods which are things that increase that are sort of earthy and watery like heavy comfort foods you know, higher fat foods, rich foods are, tend to be more heavy in nature, dairy, more congestive, things like that will make more mucus. So if you're a kapha body type in the springtime, eating um, 
you know, cough aggravating foods, you're going to potentially experience way more kapha, which could be experienced as weight gain, water weight, heaviness, tiredness, dullness, things like that, because there's too much weight. But nature said, you know what, I got this. If you guys would just listen to me for a minute, now called Nobel Prize winning circadian medicine, which Ayurveda was all about thousands of years, um, I'm gonna harvest for you all the antidotes for the tendency for you to gain more water. And it's gonna happen with things like dandelion root and other bitter roots in the early part of the spring, Oregon grape and golden seal and, and um, burdock root that are, were traditionally dug up in the early spring and put in soups and stews to help kind of cleanse the body, cleanse the liver, cleanse, scrub the intestinal tract, increase bile flow, which is like the Pac-Man inside your liver, cleaning up your liver, and when you eat some fatty food, the bile gets in your intestinal tract and it scrubs all those little villi inside your intestinal tract. So nature had this like perfectly designed plan in early spring to go in there with the bitter roots of early spring to go in there and clean and clean and clean and clean and clean the liver and clean your intestinal skin, which probably got super boggy from all the excess, very heavy, higher fat, higher carbohydrate, higher protein foods that you ate during the feast period of nature, which is the, of course, the fall, when everything's being harvested and you're pigging out, storing all that extra fuel, carbs, starches, things like that as fat, and that fat stores and insulates you and gives you energy for the long winter. But by end of winter, by early spring, most of your reserves are gone, your starches, your tubers, your grains, your seeds, many of those reserves could be gone and then you're looking down the barrel of a, of a, a late winter, early spring and wondering what we're gonna eat. And this is the traditional time people started in March, do a lot of their fasting because perhaps there just wasn't any food. <clears throat> and when you fast, the brain burns fat and fat is the spiritual fuel. It's the stable fuel. Sugar's up and down and up and down. You get energy to go run up a tree, save your life, and then crash. It's sort of high-low energy, where fat is your stable, kind of damp, you know, sm smooth. It creates a calm nervous system, a still lake, a still lake inside your nervous system to allow you to have the clarity to see what's real and what's not real. When you're like, you know, on the way to being injected from a candy bar or a 20 ounce Coca-Cola or something crazy with 120 grams of sugar or more probably, and then it injects you, you're on your way to feeling great, but then very shortly thereafter, you're on the way to feeling bad, and then you have to crave more to get back up there. That's the, 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 the sugar craziness. And that sugar craziness up and down and all those starches and stuff, in the mammal world, that would make them a little nutty. Activate receptors like serotonin and, and they would mate and fight and go into the rut and go crazy from all the sugar, right? So we have a culture that in the last 50, 60 years has been built on sort of that craziness a little bit. Um, but in the springtime, the rules were different. The rules were traditionally, there wasn't a lot of that. Uh, there was, you know, very austere foods that forced the body to burn fat, which is calm fuel, to give you a level of mental clarity. And you're detoxifying toxins that may have accumulated, yes, even in your brain, in your fat. You know, now we have 400 billion pounds of chemicals and toxins and environmental pollutants dumped in the American environment every single year, which if we don't have really good digestion, we are going to dump those toxins and store them into our fat cells, which include our brain, which doesn't do wonders for our mental clarity, cognitive function, and our ability to be clear enough to see our own reflection in the mirror, our own mental, emotional patterns of behavior that make us do the same dumb stuff again and again. And of course, Ayurveda was all about getting the body into balance. So we had the clarity to see how I can let the truth of me out, Ayur, Veda, Ayur is, is life and Veda is truth. So it's about the truth of your life and letting that out. 
So in the springtime, it's a time to, for, to get the body to burn that fat, detoxify, create a level of mental clarity and composure and calm, and then see how you can take action to free yourself from old protective patterns of behavior and do what Ayurveda calls play the game of life. Let the very delicate protective armored up petals of your flower begin to gently feel safe enough to open because it's your truth and it's who you are. But the mind said, no, 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 no. You should lock and wall that off because they might hurt your feelings. They might not love you back. They might, you know, bad things can happen. Too risky. So therefore, um, I'm not going to let you gain access to that delicate, real, most powerful and vulnerable part of you. So I'm going to force my body to, to I'm not going to, I'm not going to let that out. So I force my body to hold that. And the goal is to let those delicate petals of the flower open and let them out and let who you truly are out. So that's what Ayurveda is about. That's what the whole point of spring is. Spring cleansing for the body, for the mind, and the spirit is such a powerful tool for us because, uh, and, and, and a window not to be missed. Now the, the cleansing in the, in the fall, and the dandelions come in the spring and they seem to go away in the summer and then they come back in the fall. There's a powerful need to detoxify in the fall as well. At the end of the summer, there's a bunch of heat which dries you out. Um, it can, uh, it, and, and the liver becomes overheated from all the, the heat from summer. So that needs to be dissipated out of the body. Um, we detoxify at that time, but at the same time you're detoxifying in the fall. You're also getting ready for winter and doing some rebuilding as well. So it's a completely different animal in the fall than it is in, in the spring. And the spring is a, is a wonderful time to not miss out on nature's new year and all the benefits that come along with getting your body detoxified and getting the benefits of a, of a spring cleanse. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me. So one of the things about the spring, um, like I said, you know, it's, it's, it's a time of fasting, a time of calorie, calorie restriction. Um, and you can do a handful of that and you should think about eating less food in the spring. Now, of course we do publish a, a grocery list for every month of the year, a recipe list for every month of the year, and a superfood list as well uh, for every month uh, for free. It's called the Three Season Diet Challenge, and you can get that for free. Just sign up on my website, right on my homepage, and you start realizing that, wow, the harvest and the recipes in March are pretty austere. There's not a lot of heavy, fatty foods in them, so it's kind of much, much lighter and less dense foods. So therefore, I'm going to not have that overwhelming amount of calorie. I'm going to have to force my body to get energy from its internal reserves, which is this fat, and that's how we reset fat burning. So thinking about some simple strategies in spring, um, like calorie restriction, you know, like I said, if people ate 30% less food than the 100% more that they're eating, right? The average person eats 100% more food than they need. They eat 30% less than that. Still eating 70% more than you need, right? But all these amazing things happen. So thinking about just dialing down the calories. One way to do that is just to eat less, which is sometimes harder than others. Um, even you eat off the seasonal diets, that makes it a lot easier because you're just not going out and buying a lot of pastas and things like that. Um, also, in this time of the year, calorie restriction, um, intermittent fasting, time-restricted eating becomes a thing. Time-restricted eating means just not eating all the time, making windows where you don't eat that much. So the, the first step in that process of building yourself up to being a fat burner is to have a 13-hour fast from supper all the way to breakfast. Um, and then once you get good at that, the next step from that is to have a uh, a, a 16 hour uh, fast from, you know, from maybe lunch all the way till breakfast uh, with an eight hour uh, eating window. Um, and this is what we wrote about back in the year 2000 when I wrote my book, The Three Season Diet, and we did a study on people eating, um, <clears throat> it was a weight loss study, we had people eat three meals a day get off this, that was back when everybody was eating six meals a day, like that was the craze. So we got them off of six meals a day, had them eat three meals a day, then we had them make a, a supper a little bit smaller, like a soup or a salad, then we had them make them supper a little bit earlier, then we asked them as they got better at it to eat no supper and just have breakfast and lunch, and then have from lunch nothing all the way till breakfast the next day. 
and they lost like 1.2 pounds per week during the study. But what was really crazy was we measured their anxiety, depression, cravings, fatigue, insomnia, and exhaustion after work. And they were all significantly improved um, just by, you know, having really not everybody got to the to the um, to just two meals a day. A lot of folks weren't ready to take that leap. But once you get down to that ability to do, again, calorie restriction where you're having a breakfast and a lunch, much less than an eight hour eating window, and then nothing from there all the way till breakfast, you're forcing fat metabolism. It's so interestingly, right, all this new research about, you know, 16 and eight and all these calorie restricted, time restricted eating, uh, intermittent fasting techniques, were commonplace in, in Ayurvedic medicine, kind of the norm. And they have an old saying that says, one meal a day is for a yogi. One of my greatest teachers when I was studying in India, he was 90 something years old, he ate one meal a day. Um, two meals a day is for a bogey, which is a worker class. They need more energy. They gotta eat twice a day to get the physical energy to do the physical labor. And three meals a day was for a rogi, which is a mostly dead person sick in a hospital. So like they don't even have a name for four or five and six meal a day people because you're mostly dead at three, right? So the idea that we should be eating, um, you know, six meals a day is, is crazy. And then based on that saying, I, I designed this eating plan to go from three meals a day or six meals a day to three meals a day to an earlier supper, to a, a lighter supper, to no supper and then have that longer window. And we saw a significant weight gain, weight loss and benefits there. And you know, then once you do that in the spring, and I really recommend this only in the spring, by the way, because it's the kapha time of the year. So if you're gonna fast, this would be the window to do that. And it's not for everybody to fast, very definitely not. You know, time restricted eating and having, you know, breakfast and lunch and no dinner, that could be enough for most folks. But um, you could also, if you really wanted to knock it out of the park, you, during the spring, which is March, April, May, and June, one time a month, do a one day up to a maximum of three day water fast. And drink a little bit of, when you do that, you could um, have a little bit of salt, a couple of uh, quarter teaspoons of some salt and some water. Drink as much water as is possible during that period of time. And if you get really hungry, don't feel good, eat. It's really simple. Um, and uh, so it's a very simple thing to do. Uh, don't push it if you don't feel good, obviously. Um, and that's a, it's a, another strategy that you could do in the springtime to get that autophagy and some of that stem cell activation. Now you can also do some of the cleanses that we talk about as well, which are like the short home cleanse, which is the four day detox, which really mimics some of the things that we do in the, to get the, uh, the autophagy and stem cell activation. And then the two week Colorado cleanse, which is a powerful digestive reset, liver lymph cleanse, intestinal repair, and detox of the fat cells. And if you do that as the mono diet, like we suggest with the, with the, um, the, the short home cleanse, which is just kitchery. When I say mono diet, I mean just kitchery alone. You then definitely get the benefits of the autophagy uh, and the uh, fat cell activation, fat burning activation, and the stem cell activation, which is pretty cool as well. But you get a longer version of that. And you're eating, you're not starving, which is, I think, a really valuable piece of the puzzle. Because when your body goes into a starvation mode, there is a little bit of like, hey, there's no food here, store the fat, and therefore don't burn the fat. So it's a, a little bit tricky, right? If you starve and you strain when you're in the process of a fasting, you could inhibit the ability of the body to burn fat and detoxify and get all these benefits. Um, where when you're eating a calorie restricted diet, which is what the science now shows, Dr. Walter Longo, USC researcher on longevity, maybe the best in the world, with a book called The Longevity Diet, talks about lowering the calories significantly and seeing the benefits of autophagy and stem cell activation, which is exactly what the Ayurvedic cleanses were about, which is, I think, kind of really cool. So lots of ways to kind of navigate that. You know, one, you can do some time-restricted eating. You can do a little bit of fasting in the springtime. Definitely look at um, doing a, a, a maybe the short home cleanse which has a little bit of digestive and lymph resetting going on. And then, um, and then the, uh, maybe the Colorado cleanser is a major kind of overhaul. Now, why is it important for us to, to not just detox the body? 
because there's a reason why the body got toxic in the first place, right? The body ended up not being able to process the toxins it was exposed to. So it ended up being overwhelmed and dumping those toxins into the blood, which got stored in your fat. And that became cellulite, extra weight around your belly, arms, legs, brain fog, things like that, that are very, very real. So we, before we go in there and just pull all that yuck out of your fat stores, we want to make sure that we um, understand why they got there and what broke down to allow those impurities to build up in those fat cells and repair those systems. Now, those same digestive pathways that we need to digest, hard to digest for like wheat and dairy and corn and nuts and seeds and grains and lectins are the exact same pathways that we need to detoxify. So if you can't digest wheat, dairy, corn, nuts, seeds, or lectins give you a lot of problems, then I don't suggest that taking the lectins and the foods out of your diet <clears throat> as the solution. I think that is a great symptomatic reliever, right? I eat wheat, I feel bad. Well, I would highly tell you don't eat wheat. And I wrote a book called Eat Wheat. But we didn't solve anything by taking the wheat out of the diet. We didn't solve anything by taking the lectins out of the diet. All we did was make it easier on your digestive system. We put your digestive system on welfare. And now your digestive system says, oh, wow, I don't have to digest those things. So therefore, life is great, except that our immune system was designed, evolved, created because of a, a lot of exposure over millions of years to really hard to digest toxic foods, oxalates, uh, goitrogens, nightshades, uh, lectins, uh, phytic acids, all of these, yes, harder to digest, but they stimulate the irritation of the intestinal skin and create your gut immunity, which is about 70% of your whole body's immune system. It's called hormesis, hormesis, or sometimes called the hygiene effect or the hygiene hypothesis where a little bit of bad stuff triggers an immune response very homeopathic-esque, right? That's what homeopathy is all about, right? You give you a little bit of a poison that triggers an immune response to cure the disease. Pretty well-documented effect. That is very, very real. We now know that when you look at people who don't eat wheat versus people who do eat wheat, the people who, have, who are, who are gluten-free have four times the mercury in their blood than people who eat wheat. And those groups were broken into three groups. One group was the weed eaters, one group was the celiac folks, and one group were the people diagnosed with celiac but hadn't been on a, a wheat-free diet yet. And those two groups had four times the mercury in their blood than the weed-eating group. They also had significantly less killer T cells, measure of immune strength, when they didn't eat the wheat. And they also had less good bugs and more bad bugs when they didn't eat the wheat. On top of a couple of other studies, very big ones, two Harvard studies, both over 100,000 people, both watching people for over 30 years, and the folks who ate the most gluten, right? The four-letter word poison, public enemy number one, had the least amount of heart disease and the least amount of diabetes risk. So explain that, right? This is the poisonous thing called gluten. Well, gluten's a protein that's supposed to be broken down in your stomach, just and and other uh, and, and, and then processed into a small enough pieces of protein so it can be delivered to your bloodstream. Toxic environmental pollutants and fats are broken down in your liver and gallbladder. And if they don't break them and emulsify those fats into small little pieces like the mercury from the coal mine plumes that are on every organic vegetable, if you don't have the ability, the digestive to break it down, it'll go undigested into your small intestine along with the gluten. Those molecules, because they weren't broken down properly, are now too big to get into your blood. So they're, the big guys go into the garbage can. So the gluten molecules, the lectin molecules, the phytic acid molecules, all these things, and the bad fats, the 400 billion pounds of chemicals and yuck in the environment, they all, if they're not broken down by acid in your stomach, strong enough, good enough bioflow in your liver and gallbladder, they're going to go undigested, too big to get into your blood. They're going to end up in the collecting ducts of your lymphatic system. Ayurveda calls that rasa datu. The study of rasa, the lymph around your gut, is the study of longevity. They have an entire branch of Ayurveda dedicated to longevity, and it's a study of lymphatic flow, right? And when you have undigested food, 
in which they actually call the, the ahara rasa, the first part of your lymphatic flow is when you start digesting your food in your stomach. And if that's not done quite right, it's going to get dumped right into your lymphatic system, clog up your lymphatic system and give you all kinds of symptoms that you all know about that you blame on the food like brain fog. There's lymphs in your brain that drain three pounds of chemicals and plaque out of your brain every year while you sleep. And if you don't drain them, you feel yucky. And if you don't sleep well, you don't drain well. If you don't drain well, you don't sleep well. And if you don't digest well, you dump impurities into that lymph. They find their way into your brain and they're now linked. And, and, and they only discovered these about seven years ago, at the University of Virginia. And they found that these lymphs are linked to now, for figuring that out, to anxiety, depression, cognitive decline, inflammation, infection, and autoimmune concern. So a lot of really not good stuff happens when the lymphs in the brain and central nervous system get congested, which start upstream inside your intestinal tract. I call it the most important half inch in your body. It's probably more like a quarter inch, um, maybe even like an eighth of an inch, but it's really small where the lymph meets the, uh, and the, li the little villi in your inside of your intestinal tract meet the lymph on the outside of your intestinal tract. That's where the rubber meets the road. That's your intestinal barrier. And that is like the three little bears in there. If that gets broken down, it has to be not too dry, constipated, right? Can't be too wet, slimy or loose. It has to be just right. And if it ain't just right, the bugs don't proliferate properly. The intestinal skin as a barrier breaks down and you let these undigested proteins and fats go right into the lymphatic system. Uh, they're too big and they clog it up and they create belly fat, hard science behind that. Those fats, the good guys, that you're broken down by good bile flow, are supposed to be delivering energy as fat to every cell of your body as baseline energy. And if you can't deliver that because the road's closed, because everything's clogged up from a bad digestive system, not wheat, it's not wheat that causes the problem. It's un, not digesting those foods that cause the problem. And they go undigested into your lymph and they cause rashes on your skin because the skin associated lymphatic system gets congested. They build up in your joints because your circulatory lymph gets congested. They build up in your brain and cause brain fog because your brain lymphs are not moving and therefore congested all because the major center of lymph flow in your whole body is around your intestinal tract called the mesentery, which is now considered its own organ. It used to be the stuff that held your intestines in place. And now we know it's an organ that is 90% lymph that does major things for immune function. And if that's congested, you've got big problems. Now everybody said that lymph is the link to longevity, right? And if that's congested, you're in big trouble. So I'm telling you, if you have digestive issues and you can't eat wheat or dairy or nuts or seeds or lectins, taking them out of your diet is a good first step, no doubt. But making you thinking that you've solved all your problems by not eating lectins, you know, I've been in practice since 1984. That's when I graduated. And we used to take people off of wheat and dairy as part of natural medicine way back when. We gave people antibiotics way back when. We gave people digestive enzymes way back when. And I noticed that those folks would get better. But then six months later or so, they come back and the problems would be back. So then we take soy out of their diet and take something else out of their diet. And you start marching down the road of taking stuff out of their diet. And then what happened is all these allergy tests and food tests became really popular. And I have people still come in and they have one allergy test and they have a list of foods they can't eat. Six months later, they come back with a new allergy test with another list of foods they can't eat. And another one, it keeps changing, but we keep stacking up all the food we can't eat until there's nothing left to eat. Come on, we can do better. We got to stop treating the symptom and start treating the cause. And the cause is a broken down digestive system. And why did that happen? Well, and, and before I even go there, it's so important, I think, to realize that if you don't digest these foods well, and you just think I can stop eating them, and you will feel better, what about the mercury on every organic vegetable, that vegetable from the coal mine plumes? What about the 400 billion pounds of toxic chemicals dumped in the American environment, two million of those are cancer causing? What about the pesticides sprayed on almost every food that's now in the rain that, that you can't get rid of. So if you don't have 
really good, ridiculously good digestive strength, and you find yourself needing hydrochloric acid and digestive enzymes, I'm telling you, this is not the solution, okay? I, you know, got here because I didn't have great digestion when I was younger. I had a lot of interesting, you know, health issues that I've been able to navigate over my life. But I'm 62 years old now, and I absolutely have better, stronger digestion today than I did in my, ever in my life before. And the idea that you have to, that you don't make digestive enzymes as you age, that you can't digest well as you age, I just don't believe that. I just think that if you don't digest, you need those things. There's things that we can do to fix that. And you can do it with natural things like foods and pill or herbs and, 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 and natural things that, that are designed to reset function, not create a dependency on the next pill or a powder. That's not where we want to go. We want to reset function. And every time spring comes around, you have this like, huge opportunity to reset digestive function. And like, who wouldn't do that? Like, that just makes, me, makes, makes no sense to me why we wouldn't do that. So, so resetting digestive strength is so critically important, which is why we do that before our cleanses, as part of our cleanses. Um, when you think about the, one of the reasons why we have poor digestion, obviously pesticides kill the microbes that help us make the enzymes that help us digest these foods. So you got to do organic and even then you're going to be exposed. But at a level that if you have good digestion, you can, you can keep things moving pretty well. Um, we have all the environmental pollutants, which are very hard to digest. The mercury overwhelms us, and that becomes a problem. We have a lot of issues uh, like the processed foods. I mean, taking wheat, dairy, nuts, seeds, lectins out of your diet is sort of like eating processed food. You're taking anything hard to digest out of the diet. So I don't stimulate this need for a really good, robust digestive system. I don't trigger and, trigger and irritate the intestinal skin to respond with an immune system that gives me strength and a protective barrier because it's constantly being a little bit under attack. This is how we got here, not by eating only super highly processed, easy to digest foods. We go on welfare, like, well, I get a job when I get a check in the mail, right? We can't do that. We have to realize that, and nature, nature it all happened beautifully. So, okay, I'm gonna give you a lot of ketogenic fat burning in the spring. You're gonna burn fat because you're gonna burn, you're gonna become a fat burner, ketogenic-esque, in the springtime, for two reasons. Number one, uh, there's no food. And the only food you're gonna get is from burning your own fat. So you're gonna become ketogenic, which you do, by the natural spring famine period of calorie restriction, possibly intermittent fasting or even fasting, right? Or, so those are the, how we do it. In addition to that, if you're living off the land as a hunter-gatherer, there's a really good chance that a lot of your reserves throughout the winter are gone by late winter, early spring. Maybe the nuts are left over. They will store really easily. Grains don't store that well for that long. They will store, but you get bugs in them and stuff like that if you, if you leave them around. But the nuts will last for sure. So those would be the last thing you would kind of dig into in your, in your planning for a, a, a longer uh, kind of hibernation period of darkness, winter. Um, and then you can hunt. And when you hunt, you eat everything. So you're gonna eat more protein and a ridiculous amount of fat, the intestines, the brain, all that. You're gonna get more of that and you're gonna be more ketogenic-esque as a result of that. So the season of spring is a time to get the body into natural fat burning because of calorie restriction and natural fat, uh, fat burning or ketogenesis, possibly because of a diet that was in fact higher in fat or higher, more high in fat at that period of time. Come summer, the rules change. You, you're going to that starchy kind of time of the year where you're gonna get a lot more starch in your diet and you're gonna give the fat burners a break and you're gonna do all the starch burners because your fruits are harvested, right? And who wouldn't eat a fruit on a tree that's ripe? Um, and your grains are harvested. And we know that our ancient humans, ancestors ate grain, they did. They would gather enough wheat berries in two hours to feed them for an entire day. Um, we acquired a gene some two million years ago, it's said, not exactly sure when, to make our own amylase. We didn't make our own amylase before that, but now we do. And why would we make amylase, which is an enzyme, a digestive enzyme, specifically for starch, if we didn't eat any starch, right? We did. And probably ate a lot of it, um, a lot more than we think. 
now starch is like a four little word. Nobody wants to eat any starch at all because carbs have been bad. It's only because we ate so much of it in the last 60 years and we've overshot that runway. And now we go ketogenic, everybody feels great. But the ultimate landing of all this, I hope, would be that people realize that we're part of a circadian annual rhythm and the diets change dramatically in nature from a higher protein, higher fat diet in winter and, and more fat in the late winter to a, a, a lower austere to the fat diet in the spring where we, where, where we go into famine periods or possibly ketogenesis from a, from a, uh, a lower calorie, higher fat uh, diet from hunting, um, and then a high carb diet to our starch diet in the, in the summertime to a, uh, you know, a higher uh, protein S diet and a higher fat diet. In, in the winter. So we go from a Atkins diet in the, in the, in the winter to a kind of Jenny Craig low fat diet in the spring, sort of low cal diet in the spring to a, a high carb Dean Owners sort of Pritikin diet um, in the summertime. So, so, so it's hard to ignore the logic of that. And somewhere along the way, you see these little windows of ketogenesis, these little windows of getting more fat and not having calories and just doing fat as fuel to reset fat burners. And then you have carbs in the summer. So we kept shifted the body's fuel supply. So we never overshot any one runway. We never ended up getting bugs in the gut that just were starch, 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 delivering sugar bugs, right? That's what happens. You put eat nothing but sugar and starch, you're gonna end up with really good bugs to deliver sugar and starch. And if those starches are processed and bad for you, you end up with prediabetes, right? So now everybody says, ah, starches are bad. You gotta eat nothing but fat. Well, that's not probably how it was. I mean, when you look at the best anthropologists, they tell you that, that the, the, the hunter-gatherers, you know, ate about 30% of their diet as uh, protein, and about 40% of their diet as starch, and about uh, 30%, 25-30% of their diet as fat. So it's, it was fairly balanced, actually, and it wasn't extreme like we like to do. It was sort of fairly balanced but it did shift seasonally and we have hard science to back that up. This is the Stanford research on the Hadza tribe, the last remaining hunter-gatherer tribe, and the Hutterites, the Hutterites, which are the, uh, the, the traditional farmers from, uh, from Austria. Uh, and we found that their gut bugs dramatically changed from one season to the next. We know that the bugs in the soil change from one season to the next. So really cool things would happen. And that's also why it's also why it's so important for us to, um, to understand spring because there is a microbial surge in the soil in the spring. In other words, bugs just go crazy in the spring. It makes sense, right? The ground is warmer, it's muddier, the bugs seem to like that, things like to grow in that. In the winter, the bugs are there, but there's this major kind of population thing happening in the spring. And those bugs, where they go, they love to go to the roots of those plants and they attach to those plants. There's a symbiotic relationship. Those bugs need some chemical that those plants deliver and those plants need those bugs for something and they work together and we end up having this, this beautiful relationship that if you eat those spring foods, you inoculate your butt bugs with those seasonal bugs that help you decongest in the spring. Bugs from the summer, which dramatically change, will help you uh, get dissipate heat in the summer and in the winter boost immunity. Remember the story that I've told a couple of times where the deer who ate bark in the winter had a special type of bug microbe in their gut for digesting bark in the winter. They had different bugs in the summer for eating leaves, but if they gave the deer bark in the summertime where they had the wrong bugs, uh, didn't have the bugs for bark, they had bugs for leaves, but they ate bark in the summer, it caused such a level of indigestion it could kill the deer. So, wow, what does that mean? What should we do? Does that mean we can just eat whatever we want? No, we should recognize that foods out of the ground that weren't sprayed have natural microbiology on that that are inoculating our gut and giving us this incredible, beautiful uh, new population to give us seasonal benefit. And those bugs laterally transfer or horizontally transfer their genetic material into our gut bugs and into our genetic code to tell our genetic code, hey guys, this is what's out there all winter and this is what's been going on. You guys better get ready. And if there's any weird new stuff going on, that's how we communicate with our genetic system so we prepare 
ahead of time, ahead of the curve. Those little bugs, there's trillions of them, are like our little feelers for the outside world, and they tell us genetically what to do and prepare for. Pretty cool, right? So this is what we do in Ayurveda is we, 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 we do a, a complete overhaul for repairing the intestinal skin with a superfood called kitchri, which is split yellow mung beans. Somebody had to take the time to cut the bean and take the husk off and split it. It's a lot of work. Yeah, they really wanted that husk out of there for a reason. They would take time to hand dehusk the, the, the rice, with therefore no arsenic. They would put that in the pot, cook it with special digestive spices, and you would eat nothing but that for a week during the cleanse while you're due to repair and heal your intestinal skin. They, they would then take ghee every morning, and the ghee, which is clarified butter, uh, is phenomenal because it's basically the highest source of butyric acid on the planet. And when you take ghee, you're literally taking um, the, the, the milk and boiling off all the milk cells and protein, and you're just taking the fat of the ghee, which is the highest source of butyric acid on the planet, and it turns out that inside your intestinal tract, there are a handful of microbes, really important ones, that make butyric acid for a living. So there's literally bugs in your gut that make ghee, in a way, you could say that. Which means that how did they know to take milk and boil off all the milk solids and end up with this really, really pure fat. And it turns out that that ghee is so incredibly healing and repairing for your intestinal skin. Many of your microbes eat the butyric acid, which is highly sourced in ghee. Uh, the colon cells use butyric acid as their number one driver for energy for the cells that line your intestinal tract. They're immune boosters, they're anti-inflammatory. The benefits of ghee, grass-fed ghee, by the way, really important, um, is so powerful. But it also is a fat. So when you take it a little more every day, a little more every day, it flushes your gallbladder. And all of a sudden your gallbladder has to dump a bunch of bile. Well, what's bile? Bile is like a Pac-Man cleaning and gobbling yuck out of your liver. And when you flush it, the liver has to make new bile. So it has to then go and scrub and clean your liver even more. And while that bile is in your intestinal tract, it's scrubbing and cleaning your little villa of your intestinal tract. Cleaning, cleaning, cleaning. And it's cleaning it with, cleaning it with ghee in the environment, which is the food for the good bacteria. So you're changing the environment of your whole intestinal tract by getting your bile to get in there and do its job. Now, why would bile not be there normally? Well, because of the highly processed foods, because of the bad fats, cooked vegetable oils, polyunsaturated fatty acids that they took out of our diet, or, or, or they told us were the replacements for the saturated fats, which were deemed terrible, because they cause cholesterol levels, and they said, hey, cholesterol's bad, animal fat's bad, butter's bad, so you should be eating you know, highly refined seed oils, sunflower, safflower oils, canola oils, things like that. And when you take that oil out of the seed, it becomes highly vulnerable to becoming rancid, and therefore, the only way to get that oil in a clear plastic bottle on the grocery store shelf was to bleach it yeah, to cook it over 450 degrees, boil the heck out of it, deodorize it because it stunk like crazy when you took everything out of it, and then you can put it and use it as a cooking oil. And put it in a loaf of bread, and the loaf of bread now stays squishy for a month. Bread didn't do that until you start putting oil in it. The oil on the bread is not digestible by us, nor the microbes inside of us or on the counter, which is why the bread never goes bad on your counter. So when you eat it, where do, those, where do those bad oils that they use to preserve the bread go? They go to your liver and your gallbladder, and they congest your liver. So it's actually a medical term called bile sludge, and that bile sludge causes real problems. And we need to clean that stuff out of there and get off those bad oils, those bad cooking oils. It's really, really, really bad for you. And that bile becomes thicker and viscous and more boggy. Therefore, no Pac-Man cleaning the liver, cleaning your intestinal skin. That bile is an emulsifier for the bad fats in your environment, the mercury. And if you don't have good bile flow, those toxins go too big to get into the blood as good fats. They get collected into the garbage can, into your lymph, and stored as fat in your body somewhere. And it's not a pretty picture. 
And you can't deliver the good fats either because you don't have the bile flow to do that because you have now bile sludge. And then the, maybe the most important piece of the bile equation is that bile is one of the major emulsif uh, neutralizers, buffers for the stomach acid. So if you eat something like wheat, for example, or a lectin, for example, it requires a very strong protein to break it down. And the stomach says, I got this wheat sandwich up here and I need four ounces of bile. And the liver goes, whoa, we don't do bile anymore. We're like super backed up from all the bad fats and been constipated and all this digestive issues. So the stomach says, or the liver says, we don't have that much bile. So your stomach will hold on to all the acid waiting for the liver to turn on the bile flow and the green light to turn on. And the stomach will hold on to all that acid, give you heartburn. And eventually the stomach will just not make the acid because it knows that you don't make any bile anymore. And now you got real problems. And the number one abdominal surgery in America today, pull the gallbladder out. That's what happens. And that's what we have. But nobody tells you that. They just say, don't eat wheat. Don't eat lectins and don't eat hard to digest stuff and you'll be fine. I'm telling you, they told us not to eat cholesterol and they told us to eat polyunsaturated fatty acids in replacement and heart disease went nothing but up, okay? The, the polyunsaturated fatty acids were proven to lower cholesterol, but they actually did nothing to the heart disease except let it go higher and higher and higher. So let's not make the same dumb mistake again that we did with Western medicine concepts, which are just to say, oh, let's just treat the invader and not treat the host or the invadee, right? That's what we did with, with we do that with everything. Let's just kill the bad bug and we'll be fine. Well, now we turn out your, your, using an antibiotic to kill one bug out of a trillion, and you can't do that. You're killing almost all the bugs to kill one bug out of a trillion. It doesn't really make any sense, right? It doesn't make logical sense. And now we have problems with bacteria resistant, um, antibiotic resistant bacteria, super, super bugs and things that are gonna haunt us around the corner if we don't have really good strong digestive strength, good bile flow, intestinal skin barriers that are protective, good lymphatic flow and good liver function. And then of course, once we get all that going, we can turn the digestive system on. That's why I designed the Colorado Cleanse, to give all those benefits to reset function. And then when you're doing it, you get this like really cool thing, which is that you start to burn fat and you start to have a body that's functioning efficiently. Good stuff in, bad stuff out. I'm not accumulating. I have more mental clarity, more focus. I can then play the game of life and start to realize that, uh, what is it that truly makes me happy? Where do I derive my contentment from? Is it from all this stuff from the outside world? more stimulants, more shopping, more things, more material things from the outside? Or do you start to realize that it's really about time for me to start to let the delicate petals of my flower open and take a risk to do what I'm designed to do, which is, I really believe, like the sun, to give love, to be love, versus constantly feel you need love or need to be loved. And this is the game of life, what Ayurvedic talks about, where we, have to, we get to play that game. So that's why in the Colorado Clans, I give you a series of self-inquiry exercises to start asking some of those poignant questions like, hey, how are you, you know, what are some of your emotional patterns of behavior? How did you handle when you were back home for the holidays last Christmas? How did that work out for you? Did, were you acting like a four-year-old again? You know, what are some of the things that you can do to, to take action to free yourself from some of those patterns of behavior that clearly are not serving you any longer that you're now aware of that you weren't aware of before. And that's sort of the, 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 the icing on the cake, right? That's the thing that says, wow, not only get to digest well, eliminate well, poop well, my lymph system's better, I've lost weight, don't have cellulite, my belly, I don't have fat around my belly anymore, I'm digesting great, I'm, I'm not craving anything because I get my, my starches in the fall, I get my fats in the, in the, in the spring, not that I only eat fats in the spring or I only eat starch in the fall, but you have a, 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 a shift enough to give you the microbial shift that you need to keep you balanced, that you, so you never overstress any one set of receptors by eating the same food, same food, same food, and stimulate the same thing again and again and again. That's the beauty of nature. That's the beauty of Ayurveda. 
And that's the beauty of, of understanding that what spring is really about. Spring is really about making some powerful New, New Year's resolutions to reset function. And uh, so this year we have our cleanses that we do, uh, our, our short home cleanse, like I said, is a free ebook, a really great way to get started. It's a four day cleanse. Um, and um, it comes with a little kit that has a couple of herbs with it and the kitchery that you need for the four days and the ghee you need for the four days to get it all done. And that kit, as of now, for the next week or so, is on sale as part of our, our early bird special for our, our, our kind of cleansing season um, uh, detox that we do. Um, so that's like 15% off right now. You can take a look at that uh, on the link below. You can check that out. Also, we have our Colorado cleanse, which is our two week kind of digestive reset, lymph, liver cleanse, fat detox, as well as uh, intestinal skin repair. And that four day is also, that kit is also on sale right now. And we do the Colorado cleanse two ways, right? We do it once or twice a year. We do it as a group in the spring and the fall, where you get emails from me personally, you get conference calls with from me, question and answer sessions with me personally, you get lectures from me, a community uh, forum where you can talk to other cleansers from around the world. It's really a kind of a cool thing uh, where people feel like, wow, this is a great community. And we have a lot of folks sharing recipes and and and, um, and you also get the kit, which is the, got the, our new book, which is a seasonal cookbook as well, with all the herbs and all the kitchen and everything you need. Um, and in the book is the self inquiry exercises for the Colorado cleanse, and that that's also all on sale right now during our early bird special for the Colorado cleanse. And like I said, we twice a year we do it as a group that starts uh, April second to April fifteenth, um, and you can do it with us. But we also have what's called the Anytime Colorado Cleanse, where you get the book and the information, and you can do it on your own whenever you want to do it. Um, sometimes our dates don't work with your date, so you can just do it whenever you want. So we have three sort of cleanses to do. One, the four-day short home cleanse, great way to start. Then we have the Colorado Cleanse in two forms. One, the two-week, uh, it's a two-week uh, Anytime Cleanse. You can do it whenever you want. And then, of course, the group Colorado Cleanse, where you do it as part of our community, and you get all the support hold hand holding emails every morning tell you what to do kind of stuff and it's uh, a really a, a lot of fun and like i said it's spring eat less you know go get my three season diet challenge and start looking at the recipes that are you know and in, in the foods in the superfoods of spring and make sure that you do something this spring because it's a reset for a lot of things fat burning mood stability endurance better sleep through the night blood sugar stability mood stability, energy and vitality, endurance, just a whole bunch of things, you know, not to mention getting the bodies, get, you know, resetting your digestive strength. Because when you burn fat, you're, you're, you're forcing the, the liver and the gallbladder to deliver fats as fuel. And that's the, unfortunately, the, the kingpin of digestive strength is our liver and our gallbladder. And it takes a beating with all the processed foods and all the environmental pollutants and you know that we have in our environment. So it takes a beating. So we do need to do a little rehab on that once or twice a year. Okay, so please check out more information about this on my website at lifespa.com, and uh, you know tune into some of our cleanses this year. Like I said, right now as we speak, all the cleanses are on sale. So check it out and join us this year for our spring Colorado cleanse or do the short home cleanse. All right, thanks for listening. See you next month. I'm Dr. John Duyard. Do you like this video? Don't forget to subscribe and share. This recording is brought to you by Life Spa, where ancient Ayurvedic wisdom meets modern science. Get access to free health video newsletters by Dr. John at lifespa.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease.